Today, we're here to discuss the very exciting news that a piece of space rock that lit up the night skies in a bright fireball over the UK and Northern Europe on the 28th of February has actually been found. This is the first meteorite to be recovered in the UK in over 30 years, and so has, quite rightly, got the UK science community very excited. A team of specialist scientists from across the UK went out in search of the meteorite after the fireball was spotted and its trajectory had been calculated. This included colleagues from the University of Glasgow, Manchester, Plymouth, Imperial College London, and of course, the Open University where I'm speaking to you from today. I'm Natalie Starkey, currently a public engagement officer for physics with the Open University, but previously a meteorite researcher. So I've gathered together some of my amazing meteorite expert colleagues, some of whom were involved in the recovery of the meteorite last week, to ask them a few questions about why this is such an exciting event for UK science. We'll start with Professor Monica Grady, who has spent her career investigating meteorites. Hi, Monica, and welcome. Now, one Hi. of the questions I've got for you is how do we go about detecting these events and locating the place where the meteorite fell? How, you know, who saw this fireball and how did they figure out where to look for the rock on the ground? Lots and lots of people saw the fireball because you can stand outside if these are happening and, and see it. Very fortuitous, but lots of people saw it. It was recorded on doorbell webcams, but it was also recorded by specific cameras which are set up to record these things. There's a fireball network. It was recorded by cameras in the UK, by cameras in France, and we've worked with colleagues in Australia to take all those observations and, you know, this camera says it's going like that, and this camera says it's going like that, and this camera says it's going like that, and you cross them all over and you trace them all back, and eventually they all come back to one particular place, and you say, right, we think that's where it has landed, and then you go and look there, and there it was. Now, how rare is it that we've actually been able to do this for a meteorite and go out and find it so soon after it fell? Meteorites fall all the time. You'd be surprised how many fall, but usually we don't see them. When they come as a fireball like this, it's really rare. There's, oh, I don't know, less than a dozen have been tracked in this way. And that's only over the last sort of 10 years or so. So it's really rare to be able to do this and to have the opportunity to do it over the UK. is absolutely unbelievable. It's absolutely fascinating and it's incredible that it's actually been found on the ground because it's relatively quite small. So we're going to move on to Dr. Richard Greenwood. Now, you were actually involved with the recovery of the pieces of rock um, from Gloucestershire. So what was, you know, what was your role in trying to find these rocks? Well, I kept in contact with various members of the team who narrowed down the area and in particular Ashley King from the Natural History Museum. And he got on television and had made an appeal to the general public to ask them, uh, you know, if they find a black rock, uh, could they get in contact? And they did. And so he had what he described as a rogues gallery, a big list of pictures. And he asked me to uh, try and find a few of them where there had been some difficulty in, in actually getting hold of the owner. So I did a little bit of detective work and uh, the one or two of them looked incredibly uh, interesting. So I finally got in contact with, with the people concerned and I headed over to the area concerned and so around about quarter to three uh, on this particular afternoon, I parked my car, I walked up the drive, I met the owner, and he produced a bag, a plastic bag, as he had been asked to by Ashley, containing all the fragments. And so I opened the bag and I looked in, and I just couldn't believe what I, could, I had seen. Inside of all these fragments of a, a, a type that was totally unique to the United Kingdom. And I recognized them because it was a meteorite that I'd worked on 30 years earlier, a very rare meteorite from South Africa. And when I realized that we had just had landing in the United Kingdom for the very first time, a meteorite of this very rare type, I must, I must say, I did get a little bit emotional. I had to sort of hold it together and explain to the chap that his suspicions were absolutely correct. And on his driveway had landed uh, the first meteorite in the UK for 30 years. And what was more, the first type that had ever landed in over 250 years of studying meteorites in the United Kingdom. So it was an exceptional event. Oh, it's absolutely fascinating. What, what happens to these pieces of rocks that were recovered? Well, I was there with this really exciting situation and I knew I needed some help. So I quickly got in contact with Ashley King and I said to Ashley, look, you need to come now, this is big. And so Ashley uh, got on the train to Shelton 
And three hours later, we both returned and we discussed the, the situation with the owners, uh, actually put in place uh, all the requirements that were needed. The samples were uh, collected from the owner and they went back to London, to the Natural History Museum, where they're gonna be uh, curated, or they're being curated at the moment, and they're available for science. So scientists will be able to apply for these samples for their work. Um, it really is a, a brilliant situation. Thank you so much. I'm going to move on to Dr. Ian Frankie. Um, you've also, like the others on this call, worked on meteorites for your whole career. So again, it must be a very exciting moment for you. Now, one of the confusions is that I've heard that some of the rock was found in a village called Winchcombe in Gloucestershire. So we're often referring to the rocks as the Winchcombe meteorite, but I understand some of them were also found in a village called Woodman Coat. So what will this meteorite be called, given that it seems like it's uh, lots of pieces scattered over quite a large area in England? So meteorite showers, as they call these falls, are, are quite common. Uh, so there is a, a formal procedure within the nomenclature committee for meteorite naming. Um, this will be assessed uh, in due course once the uh, nature of the sample has also been uh, studied in more detail. Um, but my understanding is that it will be uh, the, the primary place of geographic interest will be the the name uh, of the meteorite. So it's not up for me or anybody else in this uh, call to, to make that uh, decision. But from what I've uh, understood so far, that Winchcombe does sound like a very suitable uh, name for this meteorite, given its historical uh, background and importance uh, for many centuries. So um, do we know much about what type of meteorite we're looking at? And is it very rare or what do we know about it so far? Well, uh, as Richard already alluded to, it, it is this very uh, dark coloured rock. Uh, it's got small white flecks in it as well, which tells us it's uh, probably a carbonaceous chondrite. Um, that's uh, some of the most uh, interesting and most unusual types that we have in our meteorite collection. Um, these things have a composition very much like the, 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 the bulk sun, as it were, it tells us about the very formation of the solar system and what was uh, going on four and a half billion years ago. Uh, we, these carbonaceous chondrites have different types. This is probably a CM type, and maybe Ross can expand a little bit about what he's been doing to tell us a bit more detail about the types of rocks. But these are very complex things, and they, they can be made of different types of uh, rock, all from a sort of similar types of uh, bodies. And so we do need to take it, apart, take it apart in more detail to really understand what it is before saying it's this particular type. Okay, that, that leads me on really nicely to Ross Findlay, who actually we've got you in the lab right this moment analysing some of this sample. So what is it you're doing? What are you hoping to find out uh, for the community? Well, uh, over the weekend and the few days prior to that, um, I actually got the first kind of look at the hands-on samples, some of the the, uh, the hand specimens, and they are, yeah, they're black, they're like charcoal, they've got little bits in them held together with other bits and some dusty black matrix, and uh, this beautiful like matte fusion crust on the outside where entered the atmosphere and, and uh, ablated away some of the surface of the meteorite through the heating. And my job is to take a little piece of this meteorite uh, away from the contaminated surface. And uh, that looks to be free from the fusion crust and actually crush it up and analyze it for its oxygen isotope composition in our oxygen isotope laboratory at the OU. And um, the oxygen isotopic composition of a meteorite is a bit like a fingerprint. It, it can uh, tell you what group of meteorites it might belong to. So me and the uh, wonderful oxygen isotope technician, uh, James Malley, uh, spent the weekends uh, getting a few analyses and replicates. And uh, at present, yeah, it looks like a carbonaceous chondrite. Moving on to Professor Mahesh Anand, why is it important that this meteorite was recovered so quickly and brought back to the lab? So I think for um, some of the reasons what um, Ian mentioned, that because the nature of this uh, material, you know, that, that is making up this meteorite is so unique and so fragile that longer it is exposed to the terrestrial atmosphere, it is going to compromise the quality of science that actually we can get out of this material. So imagine a, like a space mission going to another place to collect the samples. We take all the due care to actually bring it back to the earth and then curate it forever for posterity so that everybody can work on it. And likewise, we want to treat these unique uh, rare events just as a, a, a return mission. You know, so, so we strive to get to the location as soon as we could um, collect it and then curate it properly. Now, there is a slight 
clarification that I think we should make. So I believe that within the 12 hours of its fall, the owners were able to collect it in the bag. However, we didn't collect the sample of them until Wednesday afternoon, which would have been two additional days. But I think in the present context, that is still within um, a very short period of time. And in fact, this would be probably, um, I'm not wrong in saying this would be a world record in having a mm -hmm. meteorite fallen somewhere to then locate it and then bring it to the laboratory to do the first analysis on it. And I think we cannot thank everybody who was involved in this process, particularly during the pandemic times where we needed a huge amount of uh, health and safety risk assessment. And for that, mm -hmm. I really admire our colleagues at the Open University who facilitated this and the wider UK community who is now uh, going to reap the benefit uh, by doing science on this sample. And finally, we're going to come back to Professor Monica Grady. Um, what does this meteorite represent for the UK science community now? The meteorite rep represents a fantastic opportunity. One of the things we've been gearing up for is the return of samples from asteroids. Two are on their way back at the moment. One from an asteroid called Bennu, and one from an asteroid called Ryugu. What we've had is something that's come for free. It's probably going to be like the material coming back from these asteroids. We're going to be able to do a dry run for analyzing these, these samples. We're going to be able to get a whole consortium of all the specialists in the UK who have lots of different sorts of expertise from looking at the rock down a microscope at higher and higher and higher magnification for taking the spectra of it, for its isotopes, for its chemistry, for the minerals it's made from. We're going to tease it apart grain by grain and measure every single thing, especially the organics in there, because it's probably got things like that formed life building blocks of life, not viruses or anything like that, but the building blocks, the molecules. And we're going to take it apart grain by grain and we're going to find out all about it. We're going to tell its story. Thank you so much. That's been a fascinating uh, chat with all of you. I wish you all the best of luck analysing this meteorite and your colleagues at all the other universities that are involved. I look forward to hearing more about uh, learning about this meteorite in the future. Thank you.